Hello and welcome to chapter 16 on middle adulthood psychosocial development. So let's get right into it. So stress is never really great for our bodies, but it's particularly problematic once we hit middle adulthood as we might have more stressors than we had when we were younger, financial, career, children, health, things like that. And then also our immune systems tend to not be as strong as they were when we were younger. And as we know, stress does have a physical impact on the body. And so the theory that looks at this physical impact is called general adaption syndrome. And it talks about the three stages of the body's physiological reaction to stress. And so this is the sequence of, event, of events that the body goes through when the body tries to maintain homeostasis. So homeostasis is a steady internal environment when the body tries to maintain a state of being just right, not too hot, not too cold, um, not too thirsty, not too hungry, but at a very comfortable state all of the time. So for further uh, clarification on homeostasis, let's go ahead and listen to Sheldon from the Big Bang Theory explain it to Penny. Okay, what did Amy tell you? Oh, very well. I can't keep up this clever charade any longer. <laughs> she told me that you were thinking of ending it with Leonard. Okay, you listen to me. I think it's really sweet you're trying to protect your friend, but this is none of your business, got it? Excuse me, this is not about protecting my friend. <sighs> I'm a big fan of homeostasis. Do you know what that is? Of course not. Yeah. <laughs> Homeostasis refers to a system's ability to regulate its internal environment and maintain a constant condition of properties like uh, temperature or pH. Worst bedtime story ever. Yeah. <laughs> My point is, I don't like when things change. So, regardless of your feelings, I would like you to continue dating Leonard. And also, while we're on the subject, you recently changed your shampoo. I'm not comfortable with the new scent. <laughs> we please stop this madness and go back to Green Apple. Okay, so now that we have a clear understanding of what homeostasis is, let's talk about those three stages of the body's physiological reactions to stress from the general adaption syndrome theory. So the first stage is alarm reaction, or the alarm stage, and it's really a call to arms of the body's defense forces. This occurs when the body first becomes aware of the presence of a stressor, when the body realizes that something is wrong or there's some type of threat. Um, back in the day, maybe it was a lion. Uh, at today's day and age, maybe it's a fight with a loved one. But when we go into the alarm reaction stage, our sympathetic nervous system becomes energized. Hormones are released that increase our heart rate, blood pressure, and blood sugar. And so this really kind of starts putting our body into the second stage, which is called the resistance stage. And so the resistance stage is the body's reaction that is generally a reversal of the alarm reaction, or at least that's what it's attempting to do. So it's attempting to fight the stress. The body is attempting to fight the stress that it's experiencing from that stressor. So early stages of alarm lessen as the body settles into the sympathetic nervous system as resistance is working and it's actually resisting those stressors from a physical standpoint. And during this, hormones like noradrenaline and epinephrine are released, which lessen pain sensitivity cortisol, which also helps to lower stress. Uh, but as we age, as we get into middle adulthood, we really can't spend as long in this stage as we did when we were younger. So we actually can't stay in stage two, the resistance stage, for quite as long as we could when we were younger, uh, once we're in middle adulthood. So we actually get to stage three, exhaustion, much quicker in middle adulthood. And stage three exhaustion is when the body runs out of resources that it was using during the resistance stage. Um, it gets tired. And so once the body runs out of its resources, it reverts to the condition that it was in during the alarm um, stage. 
And so what we see is physical symptoms of this being worn out, of being exhausted. And the physical symptoms are high blood pressure, weak immune system. Psychological symptoms of exhaustion can be inability to concentrate, heightened irritability, and in severe cases, even disorientation and loss of touch with reality, psychosis. Um, so when the stressor ends, when the threat's over, the body will replenish its resources. But if a lot of damage is done during the exhaustion phase, um, too much tissue is being attacked or um, the blood pressure gets too high, then it can be really difficult to resort back to how you were physically prior to the stress occurring. Okay, let's take a more in-depth look at the general adaption syndrome and the effect stress has on our bodies. You've got mail. <laughs> so everyone handles stress differently, but actually research shows that our reaction to stress can really affect our physical and mental health. So one of the um, names for people being able to bounce back is resilience, and this is the ability to recover from highly stressful situations, to keep it moving, to not give up. Um, and so it's really the ability to withstand, overcome, and thrive after some type of adversity, an illness, a job loss. 
And we know through research that our degree of resilience does affect our psychological recovery. Resilient people generally are more easygoing, good-natured, have good social skills, they're independent, and they tend to be optimistic. They also have less psychological, behavioral, and learning problems. Some of the most common things that stress people out in middle adulthood are poverty, illness, crowding, drug and alcohol abuse, violence, either domestic violence or uh, some other type of violence, violence criminally, divorce, teen pregnancies. Um, and so we know that there are some protective factors, which are characteristics of resilient people that protect them from becoming stressed out. And so there's three categories of these protective factors. There's your family, um, support networks that you have, mainly friends, and then personal characteristics. So one of the personal characteristics that we see kind of protect people from becoming stressed out is optimism. And optimism is defined as people who expect positive outcomes. Being optimistic is associated with having a longer life and also having increased immune functioning. Optimists tend to have something called killer cells or higher levels of killer cells than people who are not optimistic. And killer cells are um, these cells that not only fight the spread of cancer, but they also um, stop the um, growth of cancer cells in the body. And we also know that people that are optimistic have higher T cells, which helps to produce a higher functioning immune system making the person less prone to cold and flu. We also know that optimists are less likely to become depressed, and they tend to be more successful. Optimistic students get better grades. Optimistic athletes win more games. Politicians win more elections when they're optimistic. So how do optimists stay positive in the face of all of this stress that naturally occurs in life? One of the things they do is engage in something called alternative thinking. They don't take bad things that happen too personally. They come up with alternative explanations. Um, oh, that person's probably not mad at me. They just had a bad day, for example. Or, oh, um, I don't always get a flat tire. I just had bad luck today. These would be examples of alternative thinking. Optimists also engage in something called downward social comparison. And this one sounds kind of messed up, like it's a little mean, but really it's just about being grateful and having an attitude of gratitude, as I like to say, looking at the positive in life, realizing that it could be worse. So downward social comparison is when you make yourself feel better by comparing your life to people that are less fortunate. So obviously, this isn't something that you would do vocally. Um, you wouldn't go up to someone and say, gee, I was having a really bad day, feeling real ugly, and then I saw your face, and now I feel a lot better looking. Uh, you wouldn't do that, but you would just be appreciative of the fact that you have air conditioning when you're driving in 105 degree weather and you see someone else on the 10 freeway that has their windows rolled down and is sweating bullets. So this is what downward social comparison is. So we've all heard of the midlife crisis, and this is actually a term that was derived from a Levinson's theory that we talked about before, the structure changing, structure building. But he actually referred to it as the midlife transition, and he said that this is a phase that lasts for five years on average and extends from 40 to 45. We'll talk about that more in depth later, but it's a period of reevaluation of your life so far, which includes couples evaluating their marriage. And so here we're going to talk about um, what marriage looks like in middle adulthood. And one of the things that we know is that people usually don't focus on marital problems when their kids are home, but when the kids leave, often those repressed feelings surface. And so since one of the things that happens during middle adulthood is the kids leaving, um, this can bring up a lot of issues once the kids are gone, things that haven't necessarily been addressed before. For example, a lot of couples experience what's called emotional divorce. And so sometimes partners learn to just withstand each other um, rather than actually engage in a relationship with one another. It's kind of like 
they become roommates in the emotional divorce, and this is what we see some people in middle adulthood go through. When they're having this quote-unquote emotional divorce, the only activities and interests um, that they shared before were ones that revolved around the children, and so now they don't really have anything in common. They don't really have anything to um, bond over. However, most people that have been married a long time work through this emotional divorce and um, kind of reappraise the situation and they find a way to get along. And often they're happier than they were um, when they had the kids in the house and were not focused on each other at all. So another common thing that occurs in middle adulthood um, is the empty nest syndrome and this can also affect marriage. But the empty nest syndrome refers to the feelings parents have as a result of their child leaving home. Uh, their kids might go to college, get married, get a job, or move out. And this can make parents kind of have to reassess what they do with their day if their whole lives have kind of been centered around making sure the kid gets to school okay, making sure they get breakfast, and helping them with their homework. Now they might have a sense of, who am I without this child? What's my purpose? What do I do day to day? And this can create some negative feelings. However, for some, after the negative feelings go away, usually around three months, um, it's like a second honeymoon for the relationship. Because you get to kind of sit with your partner and pat yourself on the back for doing a good job parenting, enjoy the freedom, the privacy of the kid being gone, and maybe best of all, the extra money that you have now to spend on vacations with you and your partner or on yourself. So actually, many parents report feeling closer to their kids a little while after the kids have moved out. When we look at what does make a happy marriage, what we find is that those marriages have love, friendship, similar interests, and balance. Balance um, being one of the most important factors. Balance meaning they share work, household work, um, chores, responsibilities, relaxing time. Everything is very balanced. Everything is very even between the two partners in the relationship. Studies have shown that if the wife makes more money than the husband, the husband tends to be less happy. We also know that couples who do not handle conflict respectfully um, meaning that when they're in a fight, they call each other names or make in, uh, insults, are more likely to get divorced. And another study found that people who are not married by middle adulthood often won't ever marry. And another interesting fact about people that, ne that don't get married is that they tend to have very high or very low education levels. But people right in the middle, in terms of their education level, um, often do end up getting married. Okay, so now we're going to watch a clip on what research shows um, makes a happy marriage. Every year in the United States alone, two million 77,000 couples make a legal and spiritual decision to spend the rest of their lives together <laughs> and not to have sex with anyone else, ever. He buys a ring, she buys a dress. They go shopping for all sorts of things. She takes him to Arthur Murray for ballroom dancing lessons. And the big day comes, and they'll stand before God and family and some guy her dad once did business with, and they'll vow that nothing, not abject poverty, not life-threatening illness, not complete and utter misery, will ever put the tiniest damper on their eternal love and devotion. <laughs> These optimistic young bastards promise to honor and cherish each other through hot flashes and midlife crises and a cumulative 50 pound weight gain <laughs> until that far off day when one of them is finally able to rest in peace. <laughs> you know, because they can't hear the snoring anymore. 
And then they'll get stupid drunk and smash cake in each other's faces and do the Macarena, and we'll be there, showering them with towels and toasters and drinking their free booze and throwing birdseed at them every single time, even though we know, statistically, half of them will be divorced within a decade. Yeah. Of course, the other half won't, right? They'll keep forgetting anniversaries and arguing about where to spend holidays and debating which way the toilet paper should come off of the roll. And some of them, some of them will even still be enjoying each other's company when neither of them can chew solid food anymore. And researchers want to know why. I mean, look, it doesn't take a double-blind, placebo-controlled study to figure out what makes a marriage not work, right? Disrespect, boredom, too much time on Facebook, having sex with other people. But you can have the exact opposite of all of those things. Respect, excitement, a broken internet connection, mind-numbing monogamy. <laughs> and the thing still can go to hell in a handbasket. So, What's going on when it doesn't? What do the folks who make it all the way to side-by-side -side burial plots have in common? <laughs> what are they doing right? What can we learn from them? And if you're still happily sleeping solo, why should you stop what you're doing and make it your life's work to find that one special person that you can annoy for the rest of your life? <laughs> well, Researchers spend billions of your tax dollars trying to figure that out. They stalk blissful couples, and they study their every move and mannerism, and they try to pinpoint what it is that sets them apart from their miserable neighbors and friends. And it turns out the success stories share a few similarities, actually beyond they don't have sex with other people. For instance, in the happiest marriages, the wife is thinner and better looking than the husband. It's obvious this leads, right? It's obvious that this leads to marital bliss because women, we care a great deal about being thin and good looking, whereas men mostly care about sex. Ideally, with women who are thinner and better looking than they are. The beauty of this research, though, is that no one is suggesting that women have to be thin to be happy. We just have to be thinner than our partners. <laughs> so instead of all that laborious dieting and exercising, we just need to wait for them to get fat. <laughs> Maybe bake a few pies. This is good information to have, and it's not that complicated. <laughs> Research also suggests that the happiest couples are the ones that focus on the positives, right? For example, the happy wife, instead of pointing out her husband's growing gut or suggesting he go out for a run, she might say, wow, honey, thank you for going out of your way to make me relatively thinner. <laughs> These are couples who can find good in any situation. Yeah, it was devastating when we lost everything on that fire. But it's kind of nice sleeping out here under the stars. And it's a good thing you've got all that body fat to keep us warm. <laughs> One of my favorite studies found that the more willing a husband is to do housework, the more attractive his wife will find him. Because we needed a study to tell us this. <laughs> but here's what's going on here. The more attractive she finds him, the more sex they have. The more sex they have, the nicer he is to her. The nicer he is to her, the less she nags him about leaving wet towels on the bed. And ultimately, they live happily ever after. In other words, men, you might want to pick it up a notch in the domestic department. Here's an interesting one. One study found that people who smile in childhood photographs are less likely to get a divorce. <laughs> this is an actual study, and let me clarify. The researchers were not looking at documented self-reports of childhood happiness or even studying old journals. The data were based entirely on whether people looked happy in these early pictures. Now, I don't know how old all of you are, but when I was a kid, your parents took pictures with a special kind of camera that held something called film. And by God, film was expensive. Yeah, they didn't take 300 shots of you in that rapid-fire digital video mode and then pick out the nicest, smiliest one for the Christmas card. 
Oh, no. <laughs> they dressed you up, they lined you up, and you smiled for the fucking camera like they told you to, or you could kiss your birthday party goodbye. But still, I have a huge pile of fake happy childhood pictures, and I'm glad they make me less likely than some people to get a divorce. So, what else can you do to safeguard your marriage? Do not win an Oscar for Best Actress. <laughs> I'm serious. Betty Davis, Joan Crawford, Halle Berry, Hilary Swank, Sandra Bullock, Reese Witherspoon, all of them single soon after taking home that statue. They actually call it the Oscar curse. It is the marriage kiss of death and something that should be avoided. And it's not just successfully starring in films that's dangerous. It turns out merely watching a romantic comedy causes relationship satisfaction to plummet. <laughs> Apparently, the bitter realization that maybe it could happen to us, but it obviously hasn't and it probably never will, makes our lives seem unbearably grim in comparison. And theoretically, I suppose if we opt for a film where someone gets brutally murdered or dies in a fiery car crash, we are more likely to walk out of that theater feeling like we've got it pretty good. Right? <laughs> Drinking alcohol, it seems. Bad for your marriage? Yeah. I can't tell you any more about that one because I stopped reading it at the headline. But um, here's a scary one. Divorce is contagious. That's right, when you have a close couple friend split up, it increases your chances of getting a divorce by 75%. Now, I have to say I don't get this one at all. My husband and I have watched quite a few friends divide their assets and then struggle with being our age and single in an age of sexting and Viagra and eHarmony, and I'm thinking they've done more for my marriage than a lifetime of therapy ever could. <laughs> so now, you may be wondering, why does anyone get married ever? Well, the US federal government counts more than a thousand legal benefits to being someone's spouse, a list that includes visitation rights in jail, but hopefully you'll never need that one. Um, but beyond the profound Federal perks, married people make more money. We're healthier physically and emotionally. We produce happier, more stable, and more successful kids. We have more sex than our supposedly swinging single friends, believe it or not. We even live longer, which is a pretty compelling argument for marrying someone you like a lot in the first place. <laughs> now, if you're not currently experiencing the joy of the joint tax return, I can't tell you how to find a chore-loving person of the approximately ideal size and attractiveness who prefers horror movies and doesn't have a lot of friends hovering on the brink of divorce, but I can only encourage you to try because the benefits, as I've pointed out, are significant. The bottom line is whether you're in it or you're searching for it, I believe marriage is an institution worth pursuing and protecting. So I hope you'll use the information I've given you today to weigh your personal strengths against your own risk factors. For instance, in my marriage, I'd say I'm doing okay. On the one hand, I have a husband who's annoyingly lean and incredibly handsome, so I'm obviously going to need to fatten him up. And, like I said, we have those divorced friends who may secretly or subconsciously be trying to break us up. So we have to keep an eye on that. And we do like a cocktail or two. <laughs> on the other hand, I have the fake happy picture thing. And also, my husband does a lot around the house and would happily never see another romantic comedy as long as he lives. So I've got all those things going for me. But just in case, I plan to work extra hard to not win an Oscar anytime soon. <laughs> and for the good of your relationships, I would encourage you to do the same. I'll see you at the bar. As we get older, what do our relationships with our parents look like as they too are getting older? Well, we know that in middle age, many people's relationship with their parents actually gets better. 
one of the things that occurs is that we have kids and this gives us more empathy for what we put our parents through and now we can relate we understand what it's like to be a parent and we have maybe a little more respect for them another thing that brings um middle adulthood children together with their aging parents is um again having kids and this is giving those older parents grandkids and so grandkids can also help rekindle the relationship we often see that the role reverses where we now have to take care of our aging parents this can produce new and different stresses both emotionally and financially on the caregiver most middle-aged women cite aging parents as their biggest problem over menopause and over empty nest syndrome, um, creating more stress in their life than those other two things. We also know that the closest daughter with the fewest demands in life, so fewest work responsibility, uh, fewest children, is the one that usually becomes the caregiver. And what we mean by closest is closest in proximity. So the daughter that is living closest to the elderly parent. Another thing that um, we often have to deal with as our parents get older is their chronic illnesses. So dealing with the chronic illness of your parents can have a severe strain on your psychological state. Uh, we see this to be especially true with uh, children of parents that have Alzheimer's. One of the most difficult things about Alzheimer's is the um, dementia that occurs in combination with it. And so this dementia can cause a variety of different symptoms in the person with Alzheimer's. From memory loss to disorientation, not knowing where you are, not knowing what year it is, uh, potentially even what your name is having poor judgment, making bad decisions, saying things you usually wouldn't say, um, and a variety of other symptoms that are really quite distressing for the child of the parent with Alzheimer's. But let's go ahead and watch a video that goes more in depth on what the symptoms of Alzheimer's are and how exactly Alzheimer's um, ends up creating this dementia and these symptoms in the brain. Every four seconds, someone is diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. It's the most common cause of dementia, affecting over 40 million people worldwide. And yet, finding a cure is something that still eludes researchers today. Dr. Alois Alzheimer, a German psychiatrist, first described the symptoms in 1901, when he noticed that a particular hospital patient had some peculiar problems, including difficulty sleeping, disturbed memory, drastic mood changes, and increasing confusion. When the patient passed away, Alzheimer was able to do an autopsy and test his idea that perhaps her symptoms were caused by irregularities in the brain's structure. What he found beneath the microscope were visible differences in brain tissue in the form of misfolded proteins called plaques and neurofibrillary tangles. Those plaques and tangles work together to break down the brain's structure. Plaques arise when another protein in the fatty membrane surrounding nerve cells gets sliced up by a particular enzyme, resulting in beta amyloid proteins, which are sticky and have a tendency to clump together. That clumping is what forms the things we know as plaques. These clumps block signaling and therefore communication between cells, and also seem to trigger immune reactions that cause the destruction of disabled nerve cells. In Alzheimer's disease, neurofibrillary tangles are built from a protein known as tau. The brain's nerve cells contain a network of tubes that act like a highway for food molecules, among other things. Usually, the tau protein ensures that these tubes are straight, allowing molecules to pass through freely. But in Alzheimer's disease, the protein collapses into twisted strands or tangles, making the tubes disintegrate, obstructing nutrients from reaching the nerve cell and leading to cell death. The destructive pairing of plaques and tangles starts in a region called the hippocampus, which is responsible for forming memories. That's why short-term memory loss is usually the first symptom of Alzheimer's. The proteins then progressively invade other parts of the brain, creating unique changes that signal various stages of the disease. At the front of the brain, the proteins destroy the ability to process logical thoughts. Next, they shift to the region that controls emotions, 
resulting in erratic mood changes. At the top of the brain, they cause paranoia and hallucinations. And once they reach the brain's rear, the plaques and tangles work together to erase the mind's deepest memories. Eventually, the control centers governing heart rate and breathing are overpowered as well, resulting in death. The immensely destructive nature of this disease has inspired many researchers to look for a cure, but currently, they're focused on slowing its progression. One temporary treatment helps reduce the breakdown of acetylcholine, an important chemical messenger in the brain, which is decreased in Alzheimer's patients due to the death of the nerve cells that make it. Another possible solution is a vaccine that trains the body's immune system to attack beta amyloid plaques before they can form clumps. But we still need to find an actual cure. Alzheimer's disease was discovered more than a century ago, and yet still it is not well understood. Perhaps one day we'll grasp the exact mechanisms at work behind this threat, and a solution will be unearthed. So research shows that sibling relationships continue to contribute to our development even in middle adulthood. We know that siblings certainly impact um, our understanding of relationships and our social abilities in childhood, but that doesn't stop once we get into middle adulthood. Um, one of the reasons why there's such a profound impact on our development is because sibling relationships are the longest of any relationship we will have, if you think about it, compared to a spouse who you've met uh, after the age of 18, but yet you've known your sibling that entire time, compared to your parents who will pass away and you will still be alive with your sibling, compared to friends usually. And so because this relationship is the longest, it does have a very profound effect on our development. We also know that as we get into middle adulthood and start to deal with more major life issues like um, maybe parents with Alzheimer's or parents with other chronic illnesses or divorce or the other stresses that come with middle adulthood, these bonds with our sibling can get even stronger as we deal with those major life issues. So let's go ahead and pause uh, here and take a look at a video that kind of discusses how siblings affect us and our development all throughout our life. Hey guys, Anthony and Lacey here for D News. You've got brothers and sisters, right? Did you guys get along? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, kind of? Depends on the day, really. All right. Well, my sister and I got along pretty consistently, but I still kind of dreamed of being an only child as a kid. Too, yes. Sorry, Amanda. It just <laughs> seemed like an easier life because there's like, you don't have to share toys. There's like a lot of bickering. There's a lot of compromising. But later on in life, we all learn that having siblings makes you a more well-adjusted adult, right? No, not really. There are definitely a lot of advantages to having brothers and sisters, even though siblings can have as many as six to 10 arguments an hour. And can we just point out that it's not an exaggeration? I was asking Anthony about this, and he said that they've actually studied it every six minutes. Siblings, on, some siblings. Will on argue. the dot when it came to me and my sister. And while it can be exhausting for kids and parents, those arguments actually help kids to build conflict resolution skills. Yeah. So they learn to talk things out. They learn to have empathy for people on the other side of an argument. They also learn that you can argue with someone and the relationship can still be safe, which helps with honesty, negotiation, and compromise later on in life. Having an opposite sex sibling can also help an opposite sex love life down the road because they can have more open and honest access to the opposite sex in their relationships. It makes them feel more understanding and less intimidated by them. So. If you've got any game at all, you can thank your very first wingman when you're home for the holidays. This I was month. not her very first wingman. <laughs> <laughs> A study on kindergartners with no siblings actually showed that they had less self control and scored lower on social skills like cultivating interpersonal relationships. So, does that mean that only children are doomed to social ineptitude? 
No, nah, man, it's just kindergarten. Everybody's like eating paste in kindergarten. You don't have to worry about anything. While they may initially score lower in that stuff, researchers say the difference isn't crazy and that kids can catch up pretty fast. They all learn the same social skills, they just learn it through different networks of people. Right, yeah, the whole idea that an only child is lonely and spoiled and bad at making friends came from an 1896 study by a psychologist named Granville Stanley. The study had some serious flaws in it. In fact, it was pretty much thrown out the window right away, but it just sort of stuck in everyone's head, and now we just picture our only children as a bunch of little Baruch assaults. I want it now. Granville Stanley is such a trustworthy name, though. I know, I it like does it. sound really official. <laughs> there are actually some serious advantages to being an only child, actually. For instance, siblings tend to pick up and fuel each other's bad behavior. So on the extreme end of the scale, a girl whose older sister is a teen mom is actually four times more likely than average to wind up a teen mom herself. Right, and it can go the other way too, where kids try to be as different from their siblings as they can, sometimes at the risk of their own talents and identities. A kid might give up soccer because that's their older sister's thing, even though they are actually really amazing at soccer. Also, if a kid grows up thinking their siblings are their parents' favorite, this is a funny one, they're more likely to be jealous and suspicious in romantic relationships. Way to go, Amanda. So what's the best number of kids to have? There's no real answer. Psychologists used to think that having too many siblings could lower your IQ or stunt you emotionally, but that theory has been thrown out the window as they've run new studies. In the end, it may not matter much, but I'd like to recommend having a lot of them and spacing them out so they can raise one another because delegation is the key to any efficiently run organization. I agree with that. I, I think I'm gonna go with that strategy. So guys, let us know what arrangement you think is best, only child, or would you rather have some siblings in the picture? We will be reading your thoughts in the comment section. And do not forget to subscribe to catch our next D News update. We'll see you next time. In terms of friendships in middle adulthood, we tend to start looking for quality over quantity. And so our friendships to um, tend to become fewer, but more precious to us. As we age, we cut out friends more and more, spending more time with siblings and spouses. Really at the age of 30 is when the cut begins. We tend to choose friendships that are supportive, self-defining, and stable. Take The Hangover, for example. Um, those guys didn't want to be friends with Alan because they were over 30 and they were picky about friends, like we see in research. When they were younger, though, they might thought they might have thought that Alan was really funny and different and cool and hung out with him because they were less concerned with these qualities of supportiveness and stability and loyalty and things that we're concerned with in middle adulthood. The relationship with the friends that we do keep become more fulfilling to us than they were when we were younger, and we develop um, tighter bonds and a better connectedness with those friends. So divorce is actually not very common in middle adulthood. Research shows that divorce is actually most common around year five of marriage. However, when divorce does occur during middle adult adulthood, it often takes a financial toll on the woman. Um, before the women's movement, women got larger alimony and more child support. But now, since it's common for most, most parents to work, the amount paid through child support is based on a formula that takes into account both incomes. However, half of single parent mothers do not receive full child support from the father, and 25% of the mothers that are supposed to re receive child support don't receive any. Um, one study found that African American mothers were able to handle divorce better both financially and emotionally than white mothers. These African American mothers had higher levels of personal mastery, um, which is like independence, a sense of self-efficacy that they can get things done, confidence. Um, they had higher levels of economic well-being and more support from other people after the divorce than the white mothers did. In 1970, divorce laws were liberalized in California in part because of the women's movement and this argument they made that men were um, very authoritarian and abusive and therefore women needed to be able to have what's called a no-fault divorce. And so the no-fault divorce is the law that lets people get divorced without proving some atrocious act by one of the spouses, um, like domestic violence. 
In legal language, this is also known as a dissolution of marriage. Um, another thing that we found when the divorce laws were liberalized was that men and women were to be treated equally under the new divorce laws, including the division of alimony and child support. But the problem is that we do not live in an economical, equitable system. We've talked before about that pay disparity between gender. Women get paid less than men for the same exact job. And so since men still earn more than women and are more likely to receive promotions um, and women are still expected to be primary caregivers of the children, the equal division of alimony and child support is considered to be unfair by some. Um, but these laws, the new laws that were uh, instituted in the 1970s, require that everything does be divided evenly, property, finances. And so this often requires the family home to be sold, meaning that people have to move, kids have to go to a new school, have to find new friends, and this is stressful on everyone. These new laws don't protect the middle adult women who was the homemaker and supported her husband while he worked and built up his career and she stayed home and took care of the kids. And so the question is, what is she supposed to do now for work with no experience in the 20 plus years that she stayed home with the kids and took care of the house and did all of those things while the husband was off building his career? And so because of these problems with the laws, they're currently being revised. Um, men who don't pay child support are having their uh, wages garnished and they're just given directly to the mom. So there are, they are trying to kind of correct some of the issues that exist within these divorce laws, although they were intended to make everything fair. Uh, we can see that in some ways they, they don't make everything fair. So in terms of sex and love in middle adulthood, there is often a physical change in the sexual systems during this stage of life. Um, males may experience lower levels of testosterone, fewer viable sperm, and it can take longer for them to get an erection. And due to all these changes, some men will develop something called erectile dysfunction, which can be physical, but most of the time it's psychological due to the lower levels of testosterone and it taking longer to get an erection. They start to um, have what we call performance anxiety, which is a doubt in their sexual prowess and their sexual abilities. And this ends up being a self-fulfilling prophecy, and then they don't get an erection. However, there are drugs like Viagra and Cialis that help. And so sex in middle adulthood doesn't need to be less pleasurable or less frequent. In terms of women who have gone through menopause, they may experience less vaginal lubrication and more vaginal irritation from sexual intercourse. And arousal can lessen, but generally we find that orgasms remain just as pleasurable um, as they were in younger years. So studies show that there can actually be an increase in sexual activity in middle adulthood for both genders. So let's talk about what love looks like in middle adulthood. Um, and to understand that, we have to start with a Lee's six types of love. So Lee is a psychologist that argues that there are six different types of love. There's Eros love, which is a very passionate, emotional love that we see in rom-coms um, and in the movies, stereotype of romantic love. Then there's Ludus love, which is really plain hard to get, game playing. Um, this is when the person views love as a sport and they might have many different partners at once. Storage love is really based on friendship. And so storage love is um, the person that believes that all relationships should start out with friendship and that your lover should be your best friend. Pragma love is love that is practical. It's driven by the head, not the heart. So you marry someone for financial reasons or um, because it just makes your life easier or fits with your um, standards. Mania is obsessive love. People that have mania types of love experience great emotional highs and low uh, lows. They're often very possessive and jealous of their significant other. And then the last type of love is agape love. And this is selfless, giving, altruistic, um, not expecting anything 
a type of love that's often considered to be spiritual. So we see that as we age, our conception of love also changes. We stop seeing love as being related to mania. Uh, so love is less obsessive in middle adulthood, less jealous, less possessive. Um, and we also know that love um, becomes more agape. It becomes more selfless and less selfish. Okay, what I'd like you to do now is go ahead and pause the video, head on over to Moodle, complete lecture activity number one, and when you have completed that, come on back to this point in the lecture. We shall see you then. We talked about this a little bit last time, but um, just to reiterate, Erickson's psychosocial theory of development said that during middle adulthood, um, particularly between the ages of 40 and 65, we go through this crisis of generativity versus stagnation. So generativity is the ability to be useful to ourselves and to society, to create, to generate, to leave behind a legacy, to teach our grandkids things, to write a memoir. Um, and stagnation is boredom, self-indulgence, and the inability to contribute to society. So kind of becoming stagnant in your life, which may have come from too much comfortability, and now you're not producing anything or making anything. And so when people feel stagnant, they experience a form of psychological death, according to Erickson, uh, which can lead to this midlife crisis or even resentment of children for their neediness. But generativity can be the most productive times in our life. Um, productivity in all facets of life, career-wise, family-wise, hobbies, uh, exercise. But mostly what we see during generativity is being productive at helping other people. So one study found that adults in generativity have higher levels of well-being than young adults do, and they report being happier in work and life than adults that are stagnant or experiencing stagnation. We also found that adults in church or some type of social support system were more generative than people that did not have a social support system or go to church. Okay, now let's watch a video on generativity. Generativity is a form of helping behavior that tries to pass the torch from one generation to the next. So um, we really recommend when you do volunteering, when you're helping around the neighborhood, try not to do it alone. Uh, so we talk about you know bringing other people in on it. That's really key. Uh, if you um, if you can get a neighbor, if you can recruit someone from down the block, that that helps them. Uh, you're modeling a behavior. You're involving them in something that's good for others, but also good uh, for them. Uh, and it turns out that when you um, also uh, do things for others that aren't just indirect, I mean, you know, signing a check for a charity, but you're doing something for others that really involves you in their lives, um, it's much more enriching and you stick with it over the long haul. Actually, it's interesting how many people who contribute to charitable organizations got started, for example, with the Alzheimer's Association or Spina Bifida or whatever it might be, because their parent or their child had that affliction and they got to know people. They were, they were contributing to a voluntary association. It became very meaningful to them. And then at a certain point, you know, as time passed, they became big contributors uh, externally with, you know, dollars and cents. So involve people in your helping activities. Become a little bit of an entrepreneur, a bit of an organizer. That's really important. So can people change? Um, this is a controversy in developmental psychology that comes up over and over again. Can we change throughout our life, or do we mostly stay the same, especially as it relates to our personality? So the assumption of people that say that you cannot change is that we really should pay attention in early childhood if a person can't change their personality and make sure that we shape them well when they're young. But if you're of the assumption that a person can change, then the idea is that we should really focus on adolescence and adulthood and shaping someone 
because now they're cognitively more developed than they were when they're younger and they can make better judgment and better decision uh, decisions. So there's two basic approaches to measuring personality that are based on this idea of continuity versus discontinuity or continuity versus change. So the first that kind of represents continuity, that we can't change our personality and that we stay the same throughout our lives, comes from trait theorists. So trait theorists research, uh, research the different pieces of personality. A trait uh, defined is a consistent, enduring way of thinking, feeling, or behaving. And so trait theorists um, look to describe the characteristics that make up our personality and then it's thought that they can use those traits that they find in a person to predict future behavior since their idea is that we don't change and that um, development is continuous and that we always stay the same. The only exception to this um, idea from trait theorists, they will concede that if some type of severe trauma occurs emotionally or uh, physically, then we might see a change. But other than that, trait theorists argue that we are the same throughout our lives. So the opponent view to this comes from stage theorists who take the discontinuous view or the idea that people can change. Um, and they believe that the research based on personality traits is really too narrow in focus and that we have to look at the stages of change that each person goes through in life and account for that when we're measuring someone's personality. They argue that the traits don't give us the whole picture. We need to see someone in action, see someone doing um, different things, dealing with different life issues to really get a good measure of their personality. Whereas trait approaches are usually just based on questionnaires and self-reports, so people just say what they would do, whereas stage theorists want to measure personality by observing what people would do. So let's go ahead and uh, watch a video that discusses this controversy of can you change your personality? What makes a good personality? We know it when we see it, and yet personality remains one of the most mysterious and fascinating parts of the human condition. But is any of it within our control? WSJ reporter Elizabeth Bernstein and psychologist Christopher Soto, director of the Colby Personality Lab at Colby College, are here to discuss. Thanks so much for being here, guys. Christopher, I'm going to start with you. What exactly is personality, and how much of it is innate, and how much is learned? Uh, well, personality is someone's characteristic pattern of thinking, feeling, and behaving that's generally consistent across situations. Uh, as for innate versus learned, uh, all personality traits are innate and all of them are learned as well. Uh, every personality characteristic that, that people have thought to look at have some biological basis and are at least partly influenced by people's genetic makeup. Um, but all personality traits are, are also influenced by our life experiences growing up and in adulthood. 50 more or less? or it depends on the person? 50-50. Uh, All right. I mean, if you had to put a number on it, that would, that would be about 50-50. And let me just ask you, psychologists divide personality into five broad domains, right? Openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism, correct? And which of these traits are more successful than others? Or do we need a balance of all of them? Well. Uh, in general, uh, people who are more agreeable uh, have more satisfying and more stable close relationships. People who are more conscientious tend to do better in, in work and in school. Uh, and people who are uh, less neurotic uh, tend to be happier, more satisfied with various aspects of their lives. But it, it really depends on the specific situation uh, you're interested in. You know, if you're doing a job that's adversarial and you need to be argumentative, you're probably going to be more comfortable doing that and a bit better doing that if you're lower in agreeableness, for example. It's also fascinating. And let's get specific now. Elizabeth, tell us about the subject of your Wall Street Journal article. Why did he feel he needed to change and what did he do? I talked to a young man who uh, felt that, uh, well, he, he felt that he was having some trouble at work. He avoided relationships. This was a man in his 20s, uh, especially uh, he avoided romantic relationships. He was grumpy and felt kind of sad and frustrated, withdrawn all the time. Uh, but he didn't really notice uh, how strong or how much this was really affecting others around him until his roommate at the time commented and said, you know, you're just not a happy person. And that really made him stop and rethink uh, his 
personality and he set out intentionally to fix it, to, to, to try to actually improve the things he wanted to fix. And this and isn't made up, right? Christopher, this is something we can do. We can take an active role in changing our personalities, even though it's very difficult, correct? Uh, yes, uh, personality does change across the lifespan, even in adulthood, uh, and uh, it is possible to do some of that intentionally by investing in, in particular social roles and intentionally changing our behavior. So you say natural life events can change our personality, like marriage and age, and that's something we may or may not be aware of, but then we can take a conscious role in changing it as well, is that right? Uh, yeah, that's right. There are certain types of inter interventions that people can use uh, to change their behavior, and over time, if you change a behavior for long enough, it becomes internalized and kind of becomes second nature, nature and really uh, becomes a part of your personality. So I'm going to go through some of these tips, and maybe we can talk about them afterwards that, uh, that psychologists point out. First, you, you need to recognize the damaging behavior, right? Because a lot of people are in patterns of behavior they're not even aware of. Then you need to understand when and why you react the way you do to certain things and start small, correct? You, you need to just identify a first step and practice, practice, practice. Is that right? That's right. I mean, personality is something that's generally stable. So uh, when it does change, that tends to happen pretty gradually and it, and it takes time. You don't want to set expectations that are unreasonable because then you're just going to be disappointed uh, and uh, reduce your effort. It, it's something that you really have to work at uh, in small steps and sustain over a long enough period of time that it becomes second nature, that it becomes uh, automatic and becomes internalized. And Elizabeth, you're the subject of your article did these things, right? He took these steps and he changed, correct? How yeah, he very deliberately set out to change. So he spent about an hour and a half each evening uh, journaling. He decided to question his reactions when he would react to somebody or he even a road rage incident, he would question, you know, is this really reality? Are you just, you know, is it just something you, you could you change your perspective of this? Um, and he really did change. He, he taught himself to be more calm. And, and one thing he did is he pushed himself out there to social situations. He's an introvert. He taught himself to be a little bit more outgoing. He's not an extrovert, but he's much happier. He's uh, sub settled down in some areas of his personality that he didn't care for so much. And, so, and if you ask friends and loved ones for help, that can also uh, make some changes. The good news is, right, Elizabeth, that even small changes can make a big difference. Even small changes make a big difference. It makes a big difference in um, how others see you and also, you know, how happy you're going to be. All right, so the good news is even small changes can make a big difference. Thank you so much, Elizabeth and Christopher, for being with us today. You can read more in Elizabeth's article in tomorrow's Wall Street Journal. So as the video pointed out, continuous trait theorists believe that there are five different traits that we can measure everyone in the world's personality based on. And the big five personality traits have been consistent across ages, across cultures and genders and studies being replicated. Um, it seems to be valid and it seems to hold up. So um, the five different personality traits that we can measure someone's personality on, uh, to remember them, you can use the acronym OCEAN. So the first one is openness, and this is really referring to your level of open-mindedness. The opposite of this would obviously be closed-mindedness. So we can measure a person based on how open-minded or closed-minded they are. The next one is conscientiousness, and conscientiousness just means how organized you are, how disciplined you are. Um, and the opposite of conscientiousness is disorganized. Uh, the next personality trait that we measure is extroversion. Uh, and so that's the E in the acronym OCEAN. And extroversion really um, refers to the level of social stimulation you need, how often you like to be around other people, socializing with other people. And the opposite to that would be introversion. Um, more internal, uh, self-sufficient, kind of living in your own head. The next one is agreeableness. So agreeableness is your ability to be empathetic. The opposite of agreeableness is um, disagreeableness or how likely you are to enjoy pushing someone's buttons or getting a rise out of someone. Whereas agreeableness is your ability to be understanding and empathetic of someone. And then the last of the big five personality traits is neuroticism. And neuroticism refers to how anxious you are. The opposite of this would be being calm and relaxed.
Okay, so let's go ahead and watch a video on the big five personality traits. For many years, the field of psychology has been trying to understand all those personality traits that make you a unique and special little snowflake. Hi guys, I'm Lacey Green and this is D News. It's called personality psychology and it's a booming field of research you're bound to hear about in any human psych class. One of the most well-researched and respected personality models in the field is Costin McRae's Big Five. This model evaluates how strong a person is on five different axes. Let's take a look see at those traits. Trait number one is openness to experience. This trait describes how open or closed your thinking is. Highly open people are intellectually curious, they love art and science. Open people appreciate emotion Emotion, unusual ideas, imagination, adventure, and of course, having new experiences. People with low scores tend to have more traditional interests. They prefer familiarity over doing something new and they don't really like change. Trait number two is conscientiousness. Highly conscientious people are basically those annoying overachievers who are always on top of it. They're disciplined, responsible, and good at planning ahead. A high score on conscientiousness suggests a strong ability to regulate and control your behavior. Low scores tend to be more impulsive and unorganized, you know hot mess status. Trait number three is extroversion. People tend to think of extroversion and introversion as how outgoing you are, but it's actually about how you get your energy. High scorers, the extroverts, feel recharged and energized by going out and being around people. They like parties and chit-chatting. Low scorers or introverts feel rejuvenated and energized by spending time alone. They tend to be quieter, lower key, and more deliberate. They go to a party and they have to recover the next day. This is sometimes confused with shyness, but shyness is about comfort socializing. Introversion and extroversion are about the amount of socializing you need to do your best and to feel your best. Trait number four is agreeableness. Highly agreeable people are considerate, friendly, and helpful. They just wish we could all get along, guys. They make sacrifices for others and they assume others are good people. Low scores or highly disagreeable people are suspicious, distant, and uncooperative. They place self-interest above getting along. They don't care as much about other people's well-being, and they're less likely to help you out. Basically, they're assholes. I'm just kidding, but really. And last but not least, trait number five is neuroticism. This trait measures emotional stability. Highly neurotic people are more prone to negative emotions like anxiety, anger, depression. They're easily stressed out, they're reactive, and they're more likely to be frustrated in day-to-day -day life. Low scores are more calm and collected. They don't really sweat the small stuff. They're emotionally stable and balanced. Now for a long time, it was thought that these five traits held true across regions and cultures. We've witnessed them in action across across the world, but recently, researchers found an isolated Bolivian farming community where for the first time, it doesn't seem to apply. For this community, there are only two major traits, socially beneficial behavior and industriousness. This makes an interesting suggestion about personality. If there are less developed areas where personality trends are different, society may play a stronger role in encouraging or discouraging the expression of personality traits than we once thought. Food for your brain. So guys, I'm gonna put a link in the description to take the Big Five personality test if you're interested. And here's a question for you to chew on. What traits do you think are going to be especially common amongst those of you in the D News audience? Share your thoughts down below and hit subscribe so you can get some more D News updates. Okay, so go ahead and pause the video here, head on over to Moodle and complete lecture activity number two. When you're done with that, come back to this point in the lecture. Let's talk about the famous midlife crisis, or as Levinson called it, the midlife transition. So Levinson was in fact a stage theorist, and he believed in discontinuity, or the idea that people do change all throughout their life. And he stated that by middle adulthood, men have settled down by establishing their niche in society and climbing the corporate ladder, building a family. And it's at this point in middle adulthood that they move into the midlife transition. So there are three major developmental tasks in the midlife transition, according to Levinson. The first is accept the end of early adulthood and then kind of look back and appraise your early adulthood. Did you get to do all of the things that you wanted to do? Did you sow your wild oats, so to speak, or whatever uh, idea of early adulthood you had? Did you make decisions about how middle adulthood should be? Um, because this is the second major developmental task in midlife transition. You should be at this point looking at your life and coming up with how you think it should look. 
And then the third major developmental task is dealing with the following four polarities. So Levinson called the first polarity young versus old. Although we begin to grow old, even at youth, we still want to maintain our youth because we don't want to die. At 40, our body's abilities start to decline. We are not producing kids anymore. We're not going to college. And sometimes we see this attitude emerge of there is not any major life events left except for death. And this can kind of be depressing and may lead to this midlife crisis or midlife transition. And in the way it can lead to it, according to Levin Levinson, is that we may feel this need to develop a, a legacy or to leave a legacy, uh, sort of like Erickson talked about with generativity versus stagnation. And that can go in a way that's really healthy or in a way that's unhealthy. The next polarity is destructive versus creation. And so the male going through the midlife crisis realizes that he has this power to destroy others as well as himself. In understanding his power, he realizes that he can also use it to create, but he can also use this power to destroy and then create again. Um, and so he might decide that he wants to end his marriage and start a whole new marriage, for example. Or he might decide that he wants to leave one career and start another career. The third polarity is masculinity versus femininity. So men have to stop repressing their feminine side if they are going to be able to self-actualize or reach their full human potential. And sometimes men realize that during middle adulthood. Um, and so they start to understand that being nurturing, being caring, being dependent on others has its pros. And this can allow men to develop closer bonds with the women in their lives. Um, or they might fight against this and try to become even more masculine. And then the fourth polarity of the midlife crisis, uh, crisis that needs to be dealt with is attachment versus separation. So we all need to be attached to society to survive, but we also have the ability to separate. And so the man in the midlife transition has to kind of deal with this idea of how attached do they want to be and how separate do they want to be from society and societal norms. Uh, societal norms. And they might decide that they want to be more separate, which might result in a midlife crisis, um, or they might decide that they want to be more bonded and connected, which might result in better relationships. Okay, that concludes this chapter. Go ahead and go to Moodle and do the journal and the forum, and we'll see you for the next chapter. Have a good day.